coming up on this episode of The Roundtable. It's uh, not too difficult to imagine uh, a trial during Super, T- Super Tuesday. He sweeps all the states and he's not convicted. Uh, and then heads really do begin to explode. Uh, it feels to me like we're in the general election now. I, I was told that we must respect the other in our society. <laughs> so when other <laughs> won the Nevada caucus, nothing but respect for my Nevada caucus winner. Um, I think that's I it. Think it's not going to get any better than that, James. The podcast no, is now over. It. That's no, it. I'm it's sorry. Good goodbye. <laughs> the propeller hat. I'll just activate it and fly away from the podcast over the horizon. Hello, and welcome once again to The Roundtable, your weekly publishers and editors podcast here at The American Mind. I'm your host, Spencer Clavin, features editor of The American Mind and associate editor of the Claremont Review of Books. And it's a twofer. This is the second time this year that we've all been together, which is always cause for celebration. I am joined this week by managing editor Seth Barron, editor James Poulos, and publisher and president ryan williams and there's lots to discuss this week things are heating up in the seemingly never-ending lead up to the 2024 presidential election we wanted to begin with a segment on a series of issues relating to immigration obviously this has been not just in the news lately but there's been actual movement and shifts in the winds when it comes to immigration we've covered this to some extent on the site. We've talked about it on and off on the podcast and following the remarkable success first of governors like Greg Abbott and Ron DeSantis and their tactics in attempting to raise awareness, shall we say, by busing immigrants and into blue cities and blue states, forcing the Democrats hand. There's been an amazing shift in the political headwinds over this because when affluent blue states and their favorite cities start to be taxed by the unprecedented and shocking levels of immigration that we're seeing, then suddenly it becomes a major issue that we all have to acknowledge. But the Biden administration desperately does not want to be seen as taking the initiative here. It seems like they may want to be forced into doing something. There are, of course, all sorts of perverse political incentives going on. On top of which, now we are faced with this Senate immigration deal. It's a border act that has been in, has been uh, sort of endorsed by the White House, but has raised all sorts of uh, disappointment and horror among conservatives, people who care about immigration more generally. It's bundled up with foreign aid to Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan to the tune of $118 billion. There's also a lot more spending to do with immigration as well, of course. But more concerning and alarming, I think, for most people is this the point at which the president is allowed to expel immigrants regardless of the viability of their legal rights to remain in the United States. And and this is considered way, way too high. The threshold is, is 120,000 relative to what we're dealing with. This is like, you know, it's small, it's small potatoes, especially when the momentum is on the Republican side. Meanwhile, in the House, the effort to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas has failed after four Republicans voted against it. We wanted to circle back, as it were, and talk about that, even though it's somewhat less current, because it seems like neither of these stories is is going away anytime soon. But maybe we can start with Mayorkas. What went wrong here, would you guys say? I mean, what went wrong was they didn't have the votes and they brought it to the floor. (laughs) <laughs> which I uh, mean, yes. a classic error. He didn't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. In, yeah. In my limited understanding of like legislative management, that's rule number one is you count your votes. And if you don't have the vote, you don't bring it to the floor. 
this is the sort of thing that in parliamentary systems collapses governments. Hmm. It's such an embarrassment to Republican leadership that I just can't even like speak to it. Can you imagine Nancy Pelosi losing hmm. a floor vote? This speaks to how, why did it happen? If, if you don't have the votes, don't call a vote. And also, it sort of makes you wonder why, well, if they hadn't expelled George Santos, that would have brought them a lot closer to winning this. This was such a gimme. Having Mayorkas be impeached would have provided tremendous, like, media opportunities. It would have gone on for months. It would have been a huge embarrassment to the Biden administration. This is the one campaign issue that the Republicans could win on, like, you know, immigration and why Biden is to blame for all of it. I mean, right now, I, I mean, I know we're talking about Mayorkas, but the border bill was the Democrats' effort to make this all seem like it's the Republicans' fault. Like, oh, here's this terrible pile of garbage that mm. we have to deal with, uh, both of us, and why aren't you helping? I'm not, I don't think it's going to work, but impeaching my orcas is going to be a successful no, yeah. I think everybody knows who's to blame here, but impeaching Mayorkas just would have been, it just would have been perfect. You know, it would have been the Republican answer to the January 6th committee. Hmm. Um, it really makes me frustrated about the, about the way the Republicans run things and their failure to, you know, to act like winners, even when they, they have the chamber, they, they would prefer to just be the losers. And it's, uh, I'm, I'm really annoyed about it. I still, I still want to know why they didn't have the votes. Well, I can explain that, right. James. Great. Well, with the defection of Mike Gallagher, Ken Buck, who is always a no, and our old friend, actually, old friend of Claremont from actually long before my time, a collaborator in California, Tom McClintock, all of them said, well, I'll get to the merits of their argument in a minute. But so they were no's. So it was razor thin. Steve, Steve Scalise was out for cancer treatment. They knew that ahead of time. And I guess Mike Johnson, you know, these things are finely oiled machines and you have to be a master of all the details and intelligence. And one piece that they missed was that Al Green was out for surgery and uh, they weren't expecting him to show up. Uh, irony on ironies, Al Green was one of the leading impeached Trump guys on the, when the shoe was on the other foot. Uh, Al Green got wheeled in to the floor of the house in his scrubs with no shoes on and put the nail in the coffin. Uh, I'm stealing that quote from a uh, morning's Politico recap. So uh, all credit due, even though it's a cliche term. But uh, that's how it all went down. So it's just, yeah, Seth, I, it's, it's such a huge political error because now at least half the wind are out of the impeachment sales. Uh, I think the plan was to... Um, vote to impeach even if very, very narrowly start that whole uh, ball rolling with all of its what you would think as seth mentioned would be uh, political advantages you know being able to haul well the democrats claim they could k kill it in committee but uh, uh maybe not and then you could embarrass my orcas and point out to the american public the ways in which his dereliction of constitutional duty is staggering uh in the face of what is essentially an invasion on the south southern border and um, then they were going to have a vote, a, a single vote on a standalone Israeli Israel support supplemental, which needed two thirds of the vote. They lost that too. I think they. It seems like they had planned to lose that and then run on it with the Democrats voting against it. So you take half the wind out of your sails on the impeachment thing. Maybe you maybe you won't now get it done, even with Scalise and Scalise back. Um, you know, maybe some defections start because they lose confidence in Johnson's skill, parliamentarian skill. So that half the winds are out of that sale, and it sort of overshadows the the Democrats voting against Israel funding. So it's just it's, it's really amazing. And I'll just say something. I mean, Ken Buck and McClintock and um, and Gallagher, their defense was that policy differences don't amount to high crimes and misdemeanors. And a that's a misreading of what the founders meant by high crimes and misdemeanors. In our overly legalized age, we tend to view that legally those terms when they always were meant to be political useful political tools and uh, a kind of political heuristic not a legal one and so it would have certainly been in 
impeaching Mayorkas for what he's done at the border, even at the orders of the president, and even impeaching the president would not have been a crazy thing to to most of the founders. Uh, a and then B, I, I think just it just gets the issue wrong as well. It's not mere policy differences. Uh, you could easily say that Mayorkas is in kind of daily and weekly running, rolling violation of his constitutional oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. So it seemed like an easy win and uh, an easy political win, even if you don't ultimately uh, get removal of Mayorkas because the Senate wouldn't, wouldn't convict. So it's just, it's just a shambles. So I've got a question about this, and I, I am asking out of genuine curiosity because I'm not the closest watcher of you know, congressional politics, and I probably don't have as precise a fix as, say, Ryan, you do on who all the relevant players are within the Republican Party. But that having been said, it seems to me like these two issues, the dissatisfactory Senate bill and the face plant in the House on impeachment, precisely demonstrate the dilemma of the Republican Party right now. Because on the one hand, you have people with who represent the political competence within the party who are sort of excellent whip hands, people like Mitch McConnell, who are famous for wrangling all the cats and so forth. And perhaps that skill is waning and perhaps they've, they've been down on their game recently. But whether you like or dislike them, they are sort of the Nancy Pelosi's of the Republican team. And they are their whole bag is to get things done. But also they are squishes and sad sacks, like Seth was saying. They represent this kind of like mopey politics of what Matt Peterson once called principled loserdom. And their compromises are totally unsatisfactory. And they're not the type who would ever even bring the impeachment to Mayorkas were they in the House. On the other hand, we have this concern being raised about somebody like Mike Johnson, who is supposed to be the stalwart of the more bullish new young blood in Congress, who has now been at the head of a total boondoggle when it comes to the politicking and the maneuvering and, and parliamentarianism. So first of all, is that an accurate assessment of the situation that the people with the chutzpah don't have the know-how and the people with the know-how don't have the chutzpah, speaking very broadly? And second of all, is there a figure somewhere who combines both of these abilities? Because it seems like that would be a very desirable item. And we've been flailing around for a while to find somebody that can do both. The political reporting on it says, well, maybe this would raise, re-raise the possibility of uh, moving to vacate the speakership again. But the the political and journal- And Phil with whomst? With well, whomst? Oh. I'm answering your question, yeah. Oh, sorry. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, but the political journalistic class says that's kind of unlikely because it's not clear that anyone could do any better than Johnson. So I think this is partly the artifact or product of our approach to uh, leadership in the House and the Senate over the recent decades, which is to concentrate, really to centralize leadership. And to, we've ditched long ago the older way of doing things, which was to have a lot of powerful committee chairs who had seniority uh, and their seasoned staffers. So you had a much more decentralized system in Congress. We haven't had that for a long time. So I think one of the one of the things that that does is it uh, you have a lot of most of your rank and file is not that skilled because they've never really wielded parliamentary power or even seen it in action much because um, you know with with Boehner. Um, with Pelosi, you know, it's a very small team making the decisions and basically going onto the floor or prepping to go onto the floor by telling one, everyone, this is the package and this is what we're voting on. Yeah. And McConnell, actually McConnell, what was your, your contraposition? Was it chutzpah versus? What was uh, no chutzpah versus know-how. Know -how. Yeah. Even the, even the know-how folks now, I mean, McConnell has botched this, um, funding bill on the border and Ukraine, et cetera, yeah. which Seth mentioned. And as, so which where and people are saying previously, McConnell never would have had that happen. He would have uh, pulled it across the finish line with all of the Republican base screaming about it, but he couldn't even do that this time. So <laughs> James Lankford, mm. 
I forget what what program he was on, but he was the negotiator for McConnell on this whole thing. And someone asked him, you know, what does it feel like to get thrown under the bus? And Langford replied, and run and backed over as well. Um, so <laughs> things are things are uh, not great in the Senate. The upshot of a lot of this is that uh, I don't think there's going to be much movement on any of this before the election. So it heightens the elections significance as really um, a referendum on the conduct of the Biden administration on the border as much as Biden is now saying, look, the only, th the only reason the, border the border's uh, in crisis is because of Rep MAGA Republicans. So blame them. We'll see how much traction that gets. Mm. Yeah, I don't yeah, see that. I mean, I don't know if this is like the time to talk about it, but I, I, I really don't see that as working. It's the sort of thing like here in New York, all these like the Manhattan borough president just can't stop talking about it. Or Chris Murphy, the senator from Connecticut. This is his favorite talking point. Like, this is unbelievable. This is we the Republicans wanted a deal and now you've broken it. That's the other thing. They keep talking about it. We had a deal. And the MAGA Republicans broke the deal. But it's not a deal until it's done. Like, it's not a deal if only one side likes it. Right. But I don't see that working. I mean, people know what's going on. I mean, you can't run three years ago on the basis that Trump is a racist who wants to build mm -hmm. a wall and now turn around and say, like, why are the Republicans so opposed to border security? It just doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. No, I think, I mean, this is the time to talk about it. Why not? Like, that, that is a wild and audacious gambit i've seen wilder and more audacious gambits work but you're right the contradiction is so insane it's like biden creates this situation and then holds the solution hostage or his the democrat party holds the solution hostage to all of these other totally unacceptable propositions meanwhile the republicans are kind of tripping all over their own shoes and suddenly it's like oh yeah the republicans are the only thing standing in the way between like border hawkishness and uh, america like the american people are so ready to just shut down the border and biden is chomping at the bit but oh no those nasty republicans like they won't they won't let us get this done i think trump is going to blow th I, I agree with you seth just because i think trump is going to blow through that rhetoric like a you know like tissue paper it's just the sort of thing he eats up for breakfast and this is has always been his area of big strength it's where he is most comfortable and has i think the clearest and, and most righteous point to make so yeah it just seems like a it seems like a good thing for him not so much a good thing for the republicans generally who are still in the kind of like get you a man who can do both problem like online when it's get you a man who can be both sensitive and strong or whatever it's like here get you a man that can like actually win and also not be a, an amateur. So I don't know, like remains to be seen whether that will, will, will move, but it's also just like so much of this seems like it's just going to be eclipsed by the presidential election and, and, and basically is like presidential election light. Although I think Schumer might be wanting to move forward with a vote on all the other stuff minus the immigration issues to like you know the israel and the ukraine and the taiwan funding and so on and so forth so we'll see if that has any legs well that's a good transition actually into the presidential scene because you may or may not have noticed but we did have another primary vote this one in nevada and it is i think it mu this must be the most memeable primary election ever this particular installment because trump did not compete and i want to talk with you guys whether you think this was an intentional like sort of troll that that he did he, he didn't compete which meant that nikki haley lost as of wednesday morning by 33 percentage point to quote none of these candidates so she's effectively being beaten now by other <laughs> of course the people doing this voting must mean that they want Trump instead. The process in Nevada is such that this vote itself won't actually award any delegates. The caucuses, party run caucuses, choose the delegates, of which there are 26, and Trump is going to participate in those caucuses. 
But this has been a major media embarrassment for Haley. It has underscored the obvious fact that she's running now what is just going to be a, a gauntlet of losses. I wonder, first of all, whether you guys think that Trump, with his media instincts, kind of knew that this sort of thing would happen and whether not participating was a way of generating all of the none of these candidates memes, which we are now seeing. And by the way, there is now a none of these candidates Wikipedia page as of two hours ago um, in this recording. So did Trump play this game this out to make that happen is my first question. Well, I think he um, he knew the caucuses were going to decide the electoral votes so decided to just not get involved at all publicly in the the other vote which is the regular old nevada primary so i think it was a sort of a mix of his strategic sense for spending his time on non-media events or not uh mixed with there were rumors that his or there are rumors maybe they're even confirmed that some of his um, surrogates were encouraging people on the ground to vote for none of these candidates uh, in the regular old election, primary election, so as to embarrass Nikki Haley. I, that, I would put that beyond him or his people at all. That seems like amusing politics and good guerrilla marketing. So uh, I don't know the, the fine details of it, but uh, it's an, a quote unquote embarrassment for Haley uh, as she goes into what, 17 days or 18 days away from the uh, South Carolina primary. So I, yeah, we'll see. Uh, I, I mean, but will it matter that much for Haley? I mean, she's raising money from a kind of never Trump set or anti-Trump set of, of rich donors in the normal places. She was flying back and forth, uh, you know, to fundraiser in Santa Monica, et cetera, and rich counties in Cal Southern California. So I think that money will continue to flow. The question is, will it, will it drop sharply and get cut off post South Carolina before Super Tuesday, which is March 5th? I think that'll that'll be the sign of the beginning of the end for her. And then she could still stick it out, I guess, to Super Tuesday. But I mean, I, I really haven't read anyone who suggests that she has a chance at all. She would just have to, in a way, it's um, maybe the strategy of Biden opponents, although they're having a tough time getting on in primaries occasionally, which would be to just amass some delegates and then hope for an act of God. Yeah. Um, and then you'll have more plausibility at the convention to say, a, you know, some adverse health event for Trump or Biden before then. So you're, I guess you're doing the best you can in a circumstance in which there's no chance in how you're going to win the primary. Well, also, you know, there is this persistent theme of, uh, well, what if Trump gets convicted of something? Um, I've seen a lot of people citing poll data that says, yes, Trump is the overwhelming favorite of the Republicans at this point, but if he were convicted of anything, that would drop substantially. And maybe she's hanging in there in case that happens too. I don't know if that's true though. I wonder, I just wonder like how true it is. That's true. That's to me that like knowing nothing about the future, obviously that sounds like the opposite of true. Like that's funny. People would be more <laughs> excited about it. well especially because i don't know you know one of his one of the the cases against him is you know his handling of of documents and you know oh he had these documents in his closet and that's so bad and then just yesterday i saw that they've decided not to pursue criminal investigation any further investigation of the biden documents that he had so again it just seems entirely partisan partial, political, the entire, all the prosecutions. So yeah, to your point, maybe you're right. Well, they, they come by it by polling the question. I would recommend everyone, Nate Cohn of New York Times polling operation, which they've put together a pretty sophisticated operation. He was on Henry Olson's podcast, Beyond the Polls. And so if you want to deep dive on what Nate and Henry think about all this, Nate mm -hmm. talked about how he's not even that sure about the polling that you guys are talking about where, you know, so a lot of pollsters poll people and they say, well, if Trump is convicted, would you be less likely? And they say yes. But Nate says in some ways, and Henry echoed him, it's, uh, it's, it's unclear what effect it will have because it doesn't necessarily mean that then they'll, they'll then vote for Biden. And this was the case in 2016 uh, where, you know, people just ended up hating Hillary so much 
that it overshadowed uh, their misgivings about Trump. And uh, so how will that translate in a general election in which a convicted Trump is running? It seems Nate was suggesting that at the very, at the, he suspected at the very best, it would mean fewer people would vote for Trump, but they, that wouldn't translate into a, a votes in the column for Biden. So, and then you've got the third party candidates and, you know, I mean, it's uh, also on the, it, it'll be an interesting 2024 general election, I think, or it could be very interesting. It could be just <laughs> as we see it now, which is Trump gets to delay that DC case long enough that there's no conviction. Uh, Trump and Biden are the nominees and uh, Whit Ayers, you know, old Republican campaign hand, who's certainly not a Trump fan at all, never Trumper or anti-Trumper at the very least, uh, told Bill Kristol last week, if the election were held today, Trump would win the Electoral College in a landslide. They may all be a little too reliant on normal polling. I think that might be the case. I'm not sure. Um, but that's that's interesting. I mean, Biden is seriously underwater in all, in all the swing states, uh, mostly because of the border crisis. And then finally, on the question of the documents case, you pull people on this too, and it's clear they don't really care about the documents case. Normal voters just think it's kind of too esoteric and 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 there's not much there there. I mean, they didn't catch Trump selling documents to foreign powers as the hyperventilating never Trumpers were suggesting months ago. And so people just write it off. So it seems like the most threatening case is the DC case. And now just to bring people up to speed, the um, Supreme or the uh, circuit court, the DC circuit court has failed to, to grant Trump's claim of presidential immunity from the charges in that case. He now can argue for a stay in the Supreme court of that ruling which would allow the tr the trial now to proceed and judge chuck can to have the trial start you know in a month or whatever so a conviction could happen if that all rolls as planned so that's where we are i, I don't know that we can get five votes in the supreme court to uh, stay the dc circuit's ruling and so there is a possibility that trump goes to trial you know right around uh, super tuesday or a little after and gets tied up a lot and gets to campaign less and might even get convicted before the election, whereas uh, I think their plan has been to stall. But we'll see. It's uh, not too difficult to imagine uh, a trial during Super, T Super Tuesday. He sweeps all the states and he's not convicted. Uh, and then heads really do begin to explode. Uh, it feels to me like we're in the general election now. I, I was told that we must respect the other in our society. And so when <laughs> other won the Nevada caucus, nothing but respect for my Nevada caucus winner. Um, I think that's it. I think it's, it's not going to get any better than that, James. The podcast no, is now over. That's no, it. I'm sorry. Good, goodbye. <laughs> the propeller hat. I'll just activate it and fly away from the podcast over the horizon. So I, I think it's Trump versus Biden. I think it's happening now. I think everyone's ready for it, uh, whether they're salivating or just have this like, all right, like lower your goggles and let's get this over with. I think that's kind of everyone's on the same page, uh, except apparently for Nikki Haley. And uh, in this very Internet age in which we live, I am wondering what she wants out of her life at this point. Why is she doing this? Uh, is she trying to cash in? Is she trying to like get a fandom going? Uh, sometimes you can do that, but it seems like there is no fandom. Uh, you know, Tucker Carlson and probably numerous other people have said Nikki Haley is actually not real. She does not exist. Uh, she is a sort of uh, a, an avatar that has been projected by a, a subset of the donor class. And yes, if that money dries up, it seems like, you know, for all she she, she might get a ghostwritten book out or whatever. And I don't see it moving the needle. So, um, so I'm just sort of left wondering at this point, you know, what, what, what does she want? What, what is she going for? Like some fancy job? Uh, like a, like a McKinsey job? Like, like, you know, vice chair of, um, city group or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Plausible. Not, not like very. A, like no. a, um, you know, like, uh, Ryan. The uh, former Speaker of the House, like you know, you go or Al Gore, like one of these types of jobs. I thought you meant R. Ryan, like she's gunning for the president. Yeah, yeah, she's she wants to be head of Claremont. <laughs> Watch out, Ryan. No, he Paul Ryan. Your job. Paul Ryan. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he went on some corporate boards and started, you know, for, signed up with some venture capital firm, et cetera. Yeah, right. No, I mean that does seem like 
<laughs> she's now she's now on the Gen Saki track, like just get some, you know, talking head job or some right like big donor wrangling position. Who I mean, who who knows? But yeah, I I mean I think the fandom thing, James, is right. And there's a whole cottage industry, as we all know, of sort of my, my principal mongering and maybe she can spin this into that like i made the valiant last stand against the evil donald trump but i think you're also right that mm, everybody else who lives in the real world whether you are enthusiastic about this prospect or not you've just buckled down into we are conducting our 2024 election now it is a rehash of 2020 it's gonna put those two people against each other unless some act of God intervenes. And so even actually the stuff we were talking about in the last segment feels like conducting the 2024 presidential election to me. Like that's kind of what I was gesturing toward with how much does it all really matter? If we had a more energetic Congress and a more competent Republican Party, things would be very different. I mean, there is in some ways, the circumstances are great for actual movement legislatively for the first time in a while, except that the people ain't there. We've got everything but the legislators to do legislation. And so, yeah, it's like everybody's kind of looking to consciously or unconsciously the presidential election as the one great battlefield on which to clash over all of these issues. And I just don't know, like, I, I doubt very much that that's what a Trump Biden rematch is is going to generate for us. But I maintain I, I like never make predictions because I'm bad at it. And also, you don't know what the future is. But I think, Seth, that if we get a conviction, I mean, it, it, it kind of the real hot take is it kind of depends on which case he would be convicted on. Because, right, the documents one is a nothing burger, for example. But if he gets convicted in this kind of transparently political way, I think all these people that are currently saying, you know, I would I would flee, I would abandon my Trump support are imagining a, a conviction that is quite unlike the one that might actually be handed down. And in point of fact, the reaction would be a groundswell of enthusiasm for Trump, at least if not increased support. Who knows? We'll see. Yeah, I don't know. Um, it's hard to imagine that your standard Republican voter is going to, uh, your standard Trump voter, your standard Trump supporter, MAGA type, is is just going to be so shocked, shocked by, you know, oh no, a, a DC, you're telling me that a, a, a District of Columbia jury or a Manhattan jury came down against Trump, well, I guess we better buckle in for four more years of Biden then, because that's who I'm voting for. I don't see that happening. Yeah. I mean, I guess one thing we can be sure of is we will see. We will discover the answer to all of these questions. But yeah, um, in any case, as of, as of now, the Haley train limps along. Can a train limp and whatever reasons she has for persisting are her own for nevertheless she persisted but the rest of us turn toward the general um let us now turn however to elon musk it's time to discuss a range of things that have happened in elon musk's life lately and we we didn't last week talk about the court case in delaware that ruled to cancel Musk's pay package at Tesla, which was amounted to $55.8 billion, had been worked out between Musk and the board of Tesla, as I understand, although part of the argument, part of the discussion was whether or not he misrepresented it to them and so on and so forth. But I've been listening to Elon Musk's biography by Walter Isaacson and I did get to the part where he negotiates this whole thing. And it seems like basically what he said is in a kind of characteristic Musk way, we're going to do something that is totally impossible and nobody would ever make it. And and only if we hit every one of these totally impossible goals, will I get the full $55.8 billion. 
they did it, so he got it, except that the court is against it. So there's that to discuss. And then, just to throw this into the mix before we leap in here, there's also his support of Gina Carano, whom you may recall was the, whom you may remember rather, as the female lead in Mandalorian. Disney axed her after she made sort of an overwrought Holocaust comparison leading to outroar, uh, uproar and, and fury. She then did a movie with Daily Wire, and now she is filing a lawsuit against Disney, which Musk has supported and, and bankrolled. So I guess the floor is open for hot takes about Elon Musk, but also about the extent to which any of this is, I mean, the extent to which a conflict between Musk and the regime Maybe the the most sort of sneaky way of asking this is, will this be more or less revealing than a conflict between a rematch between Trump and and Biden? What are the issues at stake here as compared to the presidential election? And where do you guys see all of this going? I mean, I think it's kind of a parallel. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, they're clearly after Musk. They I mean, the weirdest thing was when they said that the DOJ said they were suing Tesla or SpaceX for not hiring enough asylum seekers and yeah. other migrants. Uh, you know, it, it just seems like they are out to get him. But it's tough because SpaceX essentially has the contract to do all of the satellite launches, right? Mm -hmm. Um so, yeah, I, you know, it's going to, and what's really going to get crazy is over the next few months, as Facebook and YouTube uh, get in line to shut down misinformation about, about the border crisis or, or whatever the Biden administration tells them to shut down, it appears like Elon Musk is making good on his promise to be fairly libertarian. So Twitter is still going to, you know, keep amplifying all of this malinformation or disinformation, which I'm sure will drive the regime crazy. So yeah, they, they, they appear to hate him. Uh, and I think in the minds of, you know, regime halfwits, uh, Trump, you know, Elon Musk mm -hmm. and Trump will basically be merged as like a kind of, you know, double headed devil trying to destroy our democracy. Yeah, I guess my take is, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe there's some, something to like for everyone or something to hate. I'm not sure. While all of this stuff is going on that's making all these headlines, Elon Musk continues to maintain that we need to go to Mars and we need to put a chip in everyone's head. Whereas I think it would be a little more exciting if he focuses energies on we need to go to Earth and we need to take the chip out of these people's heads. That uh, is something that he could certainly afford to do. And uh, there's there's no doubt that the successor regime to Twitter has been uh, a, a net plus. Uh, some might say the bar was very low at Twitter.com. I probably wouldn't spend much time arguing with them about that. Uh, but there's a lot up in the air right now. and. And I think there's a a hope that the way back to uh, some semblance of turn of the millennium normalcy uh, involves moving people from like a one on the basedness scale to like a four on the basedness scale or something like that. Uh, you know, if you can just kind of get the ball rolling and get get people to notch over a few notches. Uh, and you can do it quickly and you can do it at scale, then like that's that's the approach that's going to win. You know, don't try to move people from a, a six to an eight. Um, it's it's going to take too long. It's going to be too much work. Well, I don't know. You know, you look at um, you look at the efforts uh, over the past 25 years to kind of, you know, move people from from purple to red. And I think a lot of money has spent and a lot of, you know, words have been uttered and it hasn't really. Uh, accomplished as much as just kind of a normal person's reaction to madness unfolding around them. Uh, that all by itself seems to be moving people from, uh, you know, from a, a low number to a, a, a somewhat higher number. Uh, so 
I don't know. I, I would really like to see um, uh, a little bit less pussyfooting around and a little more just speaking openly about uh, the need to really reconsider some of the cultural fundamentals that define the landscape. You know, going back to 1997 seems like it would be better than what we have now. And, you know, I, it's just kind of an academic argument because there is no going back. Uh, and so we got to go forward. Um, and if we're going to go forward, I think it is relatively unwise to begin with uh, visions of Mars and visions of, uh, of, of borging out our brains and focusing on things a little bit closer to uh, ground level um, matters of the heart more than matters of the, the neurons or the Martians. So uh, there's a really fascinating moment to me, fascinating moment, kind of right in the middle of the Isaacson biography where at least as Isaacson presents it, and he's certainly synthesizing a lot of material and over several years, but he presents it kind of as two things happen in Musk's life. And the first is the crisis, the sort of internal crisis that leads to the founding of OpenAI, which others will know of as the source for chat GPT. So much in the news lately as uh, potential harbinger of what tech apocalypse a glorious glittering future who's to say anyway what happens is musk freaks out about one of the many kind of science fiction thought experiments that tend to really captivate him which is that the machines are going to outstrip us they're going to get better than us and we need to find some way of outstripping them first or keeping control over them or in the Neuralink case, I mean, this is part of his hope for sort of anticipating developments in technology is, for example, that you would do something like Neuralink where you do like a humane interface between humans and, and computers. But before he ever put a chip in anybody's head, there was OpenAI, which was another effort to, to do that. At the same time, around about the same time, Musk is doing one of his classic like patrol the assembly line acts where he's really drilling into the efficiency of every part of every little process. And he has this realization that Tesla is way, way over automated. That is that the whole idea of the automatic assembly line has been oversold. And in fact, humans can do a much better job at a lot of the tasks that machines are doing. And he goes around like axing all these, all these machines. And he even like puts out this sort of notorious tweet humans are are underrated but what doesn't happen at least in isaacson's telling is a moment when elon musk turns inward and says hmm i have this fear that we're going to be replaced by machines but also i am having this insight this true insight that all the attempts to replace us by machines have actually been way oversold and have been clunky and and and, and have failed on top of which my attempts to create a self driving car have led me to the realization that even vastly powerful cameras stuck onto every inch of a car can't even replicate the miracle of a human head on on two eyes in a living human body making reactions in real time all of this suggests to me james that there's there's something kind of there, there's like a, a a link missing here that if it could be bridged, would, would turn this enormous power that Musk has kind of to the good in a way that it's now kind of chaotic neutral or something where like the, the question really is, you know, why is it that in fact, all of our attempts to replace humanity with machines end up kind of bumbling or kludgy and, and sometimes outright evil? And, and why would we want or be worried about the replacement of humanity specifically in the first place? Like, it just seems like there is, a, you know, we have a, an actively anti-human cadre of people running our politics and our boardrooms and our global organizations and all of that. And then in Musk, we have kind of this like flawed anti-regime figure who doesn't yet know like why he wants to save humanity, which is why he's like putting things in people's heads and stuff. Anyway, it's, it's a to me, it's like a fascinating character study 
And I wonder whether there is potential somewhere down the line for Musk to like become, he, he, we know he's an anti-anti-humanist, but can he be uh, an actual humanist in the futurist way that James is talking about that is not afraid of technology and that actually wants to chart a path forward? I will just note for the record that um, I think it's interesting that, so we lament sometimes the donor class on the right not being as effective and strategic and um, aggressive as the donor class on the left. But Elon uh, is sort of filling a lot of this gap and raising the cost, it seems, in his latest gambit against Disney. So, you know, he's backing Gina Carano, but he also, um, there's been this back and forth online between Mark Cuban over the last two or oh, 10 days, maybe, and all sorts of people. I mean, Cuban, for whatever his other faults, at least engages with a lot of his critics, even weird, small accounts. So that's, that's fine. But uh, Cuban has been saying for a while, like, look, people, DEI is just good business. I mean, I, I want, I invest in businesses that make money and having a good DEI program is, is, is just good business. And then people will say, well, you realize, Mark, that equity doesn't mean, it, it basically means equal results. And he spent three days arguing against people. No, of course, show me, show me where they say it's equal results. You guys are all making this up. Uh, and then in a delicious moment, someone posted this new inclusion standards document from Disney, uh, where it explicitly lays out their quota system for, for um, uh, un, uh, what they call underrepresented groups and uh, uh, meaningful integration of un, underrepresented groups. And they're basically setting quotas at all different levels of their on-screen representation, creative leadership, uh, below the line. So that must mean, you know, grips and all the lower level folks working in show business of the Disney variety. And someone posts it and says, you know, Mark Cuban, equity doesn't mean equal results or quotas. Disney, here's our equal results quota plan. Uh, and Elon has fun, you know, just retweeting these and saying, yup, or or um, saying yes in the comments. And then he posts this general call, which looks to me like what philanthropists on the right should be doing, which is raising the cost of implement, implementing DEI in the corporate world. He just, he posts this schedule by Disney that leaked. And he says, if you were discriminated against by Disney or its subsidiaries, ABC, ESPN, Marvel, et cetera, and that list is very large, I would add, just reply to this post to receive legal support. So. <laughs> Musk, you know, he has so much money that he, and he's sort of um, enjoying being iconoclastic on this question that he think is, thinks is a threat, that is the collapse of standards in the face of, of the relentless pursuit of equity. It's a threat to his businesses, it's a, his, a threat to competence. It'll certainly be a threat of getting to Mars. Uh, we talked about this maybe six months ago. Uh, and he's just deciding, well, if no one else is going to do it, I'm going to do it. And um, uh, and just sort of like he made the decision to buy Twitter in the first place. So, uh, and the, for those reasons, God bless Elon Musk. And uh, let's let's see if we can't somehow prevail upon him that Neuralink is not the key to the future. I, I will just drop as a coda to all of this the launch and lots of video now online of uh, the Apple Vision Pro, which you know if you're a traditionalist of a certain sort looks to be the harbinger of the coming of hell on earth as these zombies walk around yeah. cities moving their hands in weird ways wearing this goggle as they walk through the real, real world overlaid with all of this uh, visual tech in front of them whether they be playing games watching pornography or you know answering email while they walk their dog take your pick um one of our friends a former fellow of ours said he and he's in not in show business but he he knows show business well and has been around the Hollywood scene a lot and has a pretty good eye for um, the, the intersection of technological and digital revolution, digital technological revolution and how we perceive the world and what we spend our time on and all that. And he said, guys, I did, I did a full demo of the Apple Vision Pro. The technology is really extraordinary. This, this is bigger than the internet and we got to get ready for it. I will just drop that in there with the Neuralink uh, question. I mean, we, we're going to see a lot more digital escapism. And what that means for our politics, this has been one of James' themes in recent years, what that means for our politics, our humanity, and our cultural discourse, 
you know, is, is going to be, I think, somewhat um, tectonic. And, uh, you know, Elon's in the mix of that and uh, seems to be on the wrong side of the transhumanist question while he's doing all this other good work. Um, so it's like anything else, it's complicated and challenging. I guess all we can do is try to persuade him uh, towards the good and away from the bad. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not exactly sure. I mean, I, I've always thought Elon Musk's um, tech musings were a little, um, I mean, ever since I heard him say that there's only a one in trillions chance that we are not living in a simulation, hmm. I've just been very skeptical about any kind of like futurist fantasies that 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 he utters. But I do like his other stuff. And, you know, it would be great. Like George Soros endowed the Open Society with $50 billion. Or that's basically what they're worth now. Probably more. And they are poisoning the country. Uh, it would be so great if Elon Musk could counter that. And he could be our George Soros. And, you know, set up a fund like the Open Society. And fire wallet so it couldn't be taken over by you know progs and just let it you know spread seeds to try to improve the country or to rectify the damage that that soros has done uh that would be so great uh you know one can hope right yeah i mean i think one reasonably can hope and i have to say i think the simulation thing is just like people of a certain cast of mind don't want to get into the whole God thing. So they end up being like, but what if there were a God like entity or sort of an mm. energy of four, you know, like there's just all these God substitutes floating around and that's, kind of, Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Anyway, yeah. um, it, they makes, it makes it sound sophisticated and exciting if it's a simulation instead of, you know, like God, a, a deity. Right. Exactly. Mm. Anyway, um, very interesting. And again, it's not the last we'll hear of any of these topics, especially I think the Musk one, but it is time now, once again, for us to remind you to read the damn site, we run a website, it's called AmericanMind.org. And there's lots of good stuff that you should read there. We like to pick out one or two pieces every week that we think you should particularly pay attention to. This week, I want to highlight a piece called Stop Hating the Puritans by Timon Klein. Klein is a skillful writer and a well-read researcher. This piece, I think, really is, uh, it, it's, I, I won't say it's overdue, but it was called for. Um, the Puritans, not only the uh, intellectual kind of, uh, what's the word, the intellectual cadre in which Milton, John Milton, got his start, but also our forefathers in a very serious way, responsible for the pre-founding founding of the country and have been associated in a great historical indignity with a kind of byword for small-minded, inched, anti-sexual, uh, repressive, what, a, what a have you, norms. And Klein points out that this is mostly because they stand as a rebuke to the enforced promiscuity that now the left wants to present as, as normal or liberated or, or freeing. But he goes much, much deeper than that, takes both right and left to task for reducing the Puritans to a caricature and not a particularly accurate one. At that, this is rich with historical detail. You'll learn something, you'll enjoy it, and you'll also perhaps get, uh, you know, sort of find some stuff in here to correct your own misapprehensions, as, as I certainly did. So Stop Hating the Puritans by Time and Line. Seth, what do you got? Um, I also like Timon's piece a lot. It, it, it did occur to me that, I mean, even 40 years ago, say, or, or, or whatever, like the Puritans, they were, they, they, they featured more in the American imagination. It's, um, and they, they've sort of been erased. Uh, anyway, the piece, a piece that I liked a lot, uh, is by Faith Kuzma. It's called First Trans All the Children. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, and it's about, the many hospitals across the country that, you know, while they say publicly that, no, 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 we would never, we would never trans your children. We would never uh, give kids puberty blockers without their parents knowing. 
Uh, in fact, these are not neutral bystanders that they really believe in, you know, eminence-based medicine or, you know, the opinions of so-called experts who have taken over the, uh, the journals and the organizations that are supposed to adjudicate what the standard of care is. And uh, they are so committed to this ideology that they're willing even to skirt the law or break the law, uh, work with child protective services to seize children from non-gender affirming parents, and so on. Uh, it's a good piece. Uh, first, trans all the children. Yeah, that is a really good piece. And Kuzma has a knack, I think, for making arguments that many of us sort of suspect are right, but bringing the receipts, which is just a really, I think, important and worthwhile skill. We can all tell instinctively or we feel in the air that there's a lot of dishonesty going on in our medical establishment on this issue, but faith really knows how to uh, bring that home and make the case clearly. James, what do you got? Uh, what do I got? Um, I suppose that I should spend at least uh, 30 seconds uh, on, uh, on, on the Puritans. Um, one, one should not hate anyone, of course, uh, and you do not need to, uh, to hate anyone, including the Puritans, in order to, uh, to criticize or even question the legacy thereof. It is a tough fact, I think, that um, the, the best part of the Puritans, uh, the piety and devotion and the, the Christian content, uh, was the, the weakest read, it seemed, uh, at least according to their, their own framework. Uh, Puritanism uh, in, its, in its original form, uh, you fast forward a couple of generations and you have Unitarianism, Universalism, a Transcendentalism, uh, the Anita cult, you know, you have just a grab bag of short lived, uh, but in, in a certain sense, still very puritanical uh, offshoots. And, uh, and now today you have, you know, virulently anti-Christian uh, puritanism. So tough thing to reckon with, uh, but, but we got to do it. I will offer up draining the Pentagon swamp as the piece you should read. Uh, this is uh, Josiah Lippincott and Paul Ingracia. As they say, um, doing this will require a, quote, massive effort, uh, perhaps an effort so large that it is impossible. If it is, in fact, impossible, then, you know, we have a lot of reflecting to do on what situation we are really in as a so-called superpower. Uh, it's it's tough. And, you know, I I'm the first to say that just continuing to, to you know, oh, we just need to uh, say what the problem is as loudly as we can. And, and that's what we must do at this time. Obviously not enough. You have to be able to actually do something. And if uh, if what you're saying we should do is impossible to do, then there are real limits to that. But in this case, what with the Ukraine war going on and all this wrangling over sending uh, a, another tranche of magic money off to various other parts of the world, we, we do need to, to grapple with just how bloated and adrift our military industrial complex is. They are definitely not sending their best and serious questions are being raised as to uh, how we can remain uh, even just sort of a major military player in the world without outsourcing everything uh, security wise to the bots. Do that and you're not living in America anymore, I don't think. Um, and uh, so tough choices ahead. You know, if we have to choose between uh, our country and uh, having a, a viable national defense, um, that's not a situation we want to end up in. So perhaps uh, draining the Pentagon swamp is, uh, is actually not as onerous and daunting of a task as the alternatives. I remain convinced that if we just state our assumptions clearly enough, it'll all come right in the end. It takes, James. That's what we need. All right. Uh, yes, uh, that's another excellent piece. Ryan. Uh, I wanted to recommend a piece, but really three pieces from our old friend Dan Mahoney. His latest in a three-part series, but the last, of course, The Paradoxical, paradoxical Perversities of Postcolonial Ideology. What is postcolonialism, you may ask? Well, you should know. Uh, you should go check it out. It's, um, for lack of a better term, for lack of a better description, it's basically critical race theory as applied to the last two centuries of, or maybe five centuries 
of Western foreign policy, diplomacy, and imperialism. Um, and uh, Dan, you know, I, I think the uh, the analog to the DEI quotas that are rising up in corporate hiring and academics and everything on the international scene would be basically the immigration policy that's been pursued since 1965 in America, which is, you know, it's been too white and too Anglo for too long, maybe too Anglo-Catholic and too white for too long. And now we need to atone for those sins. And we got to get our numbers up from the global South because we have harmed them through centuries of colonialism. There's a whole academic literature about this, and it's in many ways a, as absurd and tendentious as some of the stuff as applied to American history and uh, American civics and everything else. It's just something that learned citizens and concerned patriots should know about, and it means actually wading into some of the academic literature on it uh, and some of the eh, slightly more popular literature on it. Um, so Dan does a kind of survey of that whole waterfront in these three pieces. And the latest piece is the, the what I mentioned, the published uh, two days ago, The Paradoxical Perversities of Postcolonial Ideology. It's just a nice primer. So go check it out. I would like to endorse or perhaps tease Dan's forthcoming CRB piece. We sometimes also mention that the Claremont Review of Books is our sister publication at ClaremontReviewBooks.com. comes out less frequently, four times a year. But Dan, who always writes with great nobility and as sort of wide breadth of knowledge, has drilled down in his latest into a particular subject, which is the uh, state of Russian politics and the history of Russian politics going back m several hundreds of years. He's reviewing two books, Russian Liberalism and Russian Conservatism, but he fills in a lot of really interesting shades in between those two poles and helps to clarify not just the current situation in Russia, but also a whole nuanced and subtle history that we, that I at least knew very little about. So I learned an enormous amount from reading that piece. And I think you should subscribe to the Claremont Review of Books so that you get this latest issue, which is coming out quite soon. I'm working through copy edits now, so it should be in mailboxes not, not terribly long from now. And with that, we've reached the limit of the time that we have. And so we want to thank you all very much for listening. If you like the work that we do and you want to learn more about Claremont Institute and our mission to defend and recover the American idea, you can check out our sister publication, which I just mentioned, the Claremont Review of Books. You can also check out our DC-based Center for the American Way of Life at dc.claremont.org. And if you want to support the work we do by sending us a donation, we would be most grateful. You can do that at claremont.org slash donate. Finally, finally, the probably the easiest way to help us out is to rate, review, share, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Drop us a five-star rating on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. At the very, very least, if you have criticisms, please keep them to yourself because those five-star reviews really do help bump us up in the eyes, the, the unseeing robot eyes of the algorithm, which is part of how we get the word out about the show and grow the audience. Thanks to our production crew, Jake Gannon and Logan Zapieri, and thanks very much to all of you for listening. We will talk to you next week.